Welcome back or welcome if you're just joining us. It's the France 24 debate. The first round of France's presidential uh, legislative elections has uh, redrawn the, the landscape in parliament with the center-right and center-left blocs uh, blown away by the brand new party of 39-year-old president Emmanuel Macron. With us to talk about it, Macron supporter Lex Paulson, who teaches at the French Political Science Institute Sciences Po. Majid Messaouden, municipal councillor in the northern Paris suburb of Saint-Denis from the Front de Gauche party. Uh, as well uh, with us is Bruno Bernard, member of uh, the Les Républicains uh, party and France 24 Europe editor Yves Irvine. Before the break, we were talking uh, about how this vote has uh, shrunk the support of what Macron's camp calls the extremes. Now, uh, Marine Le Pen, the leader of the far right, who we faced off against in the runoff of the presidential election, back on the campaign trail this Monday. It's her, uh, Monday, it's her fifth attempt at winning a seat in the French parliament. The bad news, there's also a chance Marine Le Pen will be the only national front MP at the National Assembly. It's our own voters, young people, people with lower incomes who fail to turn out in this election. We've seen the consequences of this, so it's extremely important we mobilize for the second round. All right, Marine Le Pen uh, speaking. Uh, the National Front, which got less than 14 percent of the vote in this election, a big disappointment for her. Uh, far left leader Jean-Luc Mélenchon, he also has a good shot of entering parliament. Now, he's been running in Marseille. He's already eliminated the socialist candidate there and still hopes to supplant the socialists as the leader of the left going forth. These results attest to a very unstable political situation, and the sheer number of people who abstained shows that there will be no parliamentary majority that's able to destroy our labor code, to reduce our freedoms, to promote policies that are harmful to the environment, policies that help the rich. All the policies, in fact, that the president is advocating. It sounds a little bit like uh, Jean-Luc Mélenchon, because is he going to be the Mr. Dr. No, basically, of the next parliament? When of course. Uh, he will be Mr. No. Uh, and he, he wants to be um, the, the one that uh, represents all the left in, in, in this future assembly. But the problem is that uh, Jean-Luc Mélenchon lives in Paris. He's, he's running in uh, this election in Marseille, and he's already elected at the European Parliament. So uh, this is a big problem. Uh, like Marine Le Pen, like Florian Philippot, they are already elected in, in another assembly, and they are running for uh, these elections. The problem of uh, Jean-Luc Mélenchon is that he's responsible mostly of uh, the defeat of what I call the left of the left. Because he had a lot of momentum after the first round yeah. of the presidential election. What should he have done differently at that point? Well, he had 19% the of the vote, which was a good score. Without the support of uh, the, the Communist Party, of the Communist uh, activists, of the Communist uh, um, city councillors, uh, he, he wouldn't have uh, um, won that score in, in, in the last uh, uh, elections. But as long as he won, uh, he decided to run uh, this uh, legislative election to go to only. No. Uh, he just wanted to kill uh, the last uh, communist MPs and uh, with his France Insoumise label, which is not the new Front Gauche, but he, he wants to, repra to, to replace it. And that's the main problem. And, and I think that... So where does this leave the left as a whole? I don't know. I don't know. Well, there's no one, I don't know one where, left in where, France. Where, 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 where I live now, uh, it's very difficult. Uh, in my city, uh, the communist uh, uh, candidate uh, is one of the uh, candidates that uh, um, succeeded in having the support of Jean-Luc Mélenchon. There are like three or four candidates in, in France. But I think that uh, what did Jean-Luc Mélenchon is uh, uh, suicidal uh, for the future. And, and I think that um, Can I ask you a question? Because yeah. when you look at what happens in the presidential uh, between Mélenchon and Hamon, yeah. wouldn't you have said that you know, Hamon should have dropped out and joined Mélenchon? No. 
Why not? Because we, we can't make uh, these kind of additions. Uh, people that vote for AMO will not necessarily vote for Not Mélenchon. necessarily, but... Why not? Uh, what's uh, the, what's the big... Fraction, and it's true at the opposite. For example, for example, uh, I decided not to vote for Mélenchon. But uh, if AMO would have joined uh, Mélenchon, uh, my, my decision would have been more stronger uh, because uh, Amon represented for me uh, François Hollande uh, debt. Uh, and, and I think that for many communist activists, uh, it, it was not possible to have an agreement with Amon. And for the socialists, it, it was not possible to have an agreement for, with Jean-Luc Mélenchon or with the Communist Party. Ivervine, the fracture within the French left, Europe was perhaps the, 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 the political third rail there with the, the attitudes towards the EU and a more federal Europe or not. Uh, the, the French left squarely divided on that score. Yeah, but again, there was only one candidate out of all the 19 that started that, that ran on a pro-EU platform that, you know, wanted to put France front and centre in a united EU bloc. Mm. Uh, and, and he it was a year maybe to, to, to also play that up when we've had just seen the UK vote to leave the EU, uh, seeing the chaos that that has led to so far. Uh, he, he gained on all these different changes working across the EU. And I think that is a momentum, you know, that appeal to people as well as just the idea of change, something new. Let's look at some of the reactions outside of France. The leader of the Liberals and Greens in the European Parliament making no effort to contain his joy this Monday. Guy Verhofstadt uh, tweeting the following. Uh, a great news from France. Landslide victory for Emmanuel Macron. France and Europe will change for the better. Hashtag en marche, the, the party of, uh, of Macron. The German chancellor and her social democratic rival in next September's general election, both expressing approval of the result. The president of the German parliament, who hails from Angela Merkel's CDU party, making it nonetheless sound like uh, there'll be no free lunch for the French under Macron. It is at least as important that this new president finally tackles the need for reform in his own country. <laughs> What's your reaction to that statement, Bruno Bernard? It's a, a classic German move, I mean, <laughs> um, because every time there's a new president, I mean, it happened with Sarkozy. I mean, Sarkozy had huge momentum in 10 years ago, and uh, unfortunately nothing uh, really serious happened on the uh, reform front. Uh, so I think uh, the Germans uh, aren't that, um, well, um, how do you say that uh, nicely? <laughs> They're not that thrilled about about having Macron because they've seen it all before. I mean, it's it, what is it? Is it like the fourth French president? Is that, is that why they're not have? thrilled? Because I'm, I was reading articles this Monday that describe Macron as the new leader of Europe. Merkel is the new leader, and she's the current leader of Europe, and yeah. she's the ancient leader of Europe. She, she will remain. Uh, she will be uh, the future leader. <laughs> and she's the future of leader of Europe because Macron will have to do everything first in France in order to pretend uh, and, and maybe run for the job of uh, Europe leader. I just I mean to add to add an American perspective on this, I think that, that the French-German rivalry, which is often seen as zero-sum, in this case may be uh, more collaboration than confrontation. America has essentially opted out of the post-1945 global order. Uh, China is, is not necessarily going to be replacing America as a power. And Europe, perhaps for the uh, most uh, since 1945, has, uh, has an opportunity uh, to reassume uh, a role it once played on the, on the global stage as a, as a, as a standard bear for uh, for rights and values but without the baggage of of the of the 19th and 20th century colonies and I, I think I think you could see France and Germany working together on that score to restore Europe's place in the world but also perhaps because the UK if they step away because we're still waiting for these talks to even start about the the UK's departure but that would be one of the two big defense countries in the EU which means that France's role automatically becomes larger on that EU level mm -hmm. it is then the uh, country of defense in the EU so that makes it more more interesting to Germany as well. But that's why they're cutting budget in the in the French defence budget at the moment. Nonetheless, out of the whole EU, it is it is uh, the one country that will will appeal uh, to to the rest of the EU on that level. And yes, indeed, th this statement we hear from Germany is really what we've heard in the past that you know France will have to reform its budget first and get it in line with the EU deficit uh, before they will hear all of Macron's proposed reforms to the to the eurozone to having a president to having a budget and all of that uh, Merkel and Germany in general 
fear the idea that they will have to, you know, pay more into the EU and, and, and pay out for other people's debts. Uh, Yves Irvine, on Tuesday, there's a certain Theresa May who will be visiting Paris. Indeed. Uh, and she'll be uh, sitting down with Emmanuel Macron, a weakened Theresa May. I mean, yeah, two very different pictures. Not an easy uh, visit, I would imagine, for Theresa May. She was hoping to get this absolute majority. She did not. She gambled and lost and is coming with a minority government to a man who looks very much set to have what she wanted. Now, you were talking about defence ties uh, and uh, the, the, the bilateral the ties between France and the UK. I mean, the two, arm, the two armies depend on each other, basically, at the, cur at the current stage. What happens going Currently. forward when Macron has really shown tough love for Brexit? He's shown tough love for Brexit, um, but again, I mean, that's we haven't even started these negotiations. So you have 27 heads of state all showing united front, all saying we have to prove that not being a member is not better than being a member. But at the same time, when it comes down to common goals, common interests, of course we're going to see uh, cooperation. Indeed, you know, counterterrorism, I believe, is the crux of the talks on Tuesday. Uh, there are a lot of agreements between France and the UK, but again, there's also a lot of financial interests going the other way. So it'll all come down to, you know, which side of the balance sheet weighs more? And when you see Theresa May in negotiations with uh, the Northern Irish uh, Unionists of the DUP to, to get an alliance uh, for her government, what do people in the rest of Ireland think of the role that someone like Emmanuel Macron should be playing on the European stage? how he should be handling it, Theresa May. Um, I don't know if the Irish are as yet looking to Emmanuel Macron uh, to, 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 to delve into that sort of issue, but definitely people are very concerned. We heard from the outgoing uh, Taoiseach Enda Kenny, you know, concerned that this DUP party would have influence and a very strong role on the UK government because it, it does put the peace process in Northern Ireland, you know, slightly under, under pressure because the devolved uh, power-sharing government, which has been struggling since January because of divisions between the National Sinn Féin and the DUP party. That works on the basis that neither Dublin or London interfere. And if you have one of those parties that is working in mm. unison with the London government. Majid Misaudan, what kind of relationship should Emmanuel Macron have with Theresa May? How should he handle her? Well, she she lost the, the last election. So he is he, she didn't lose. She didn't lose. She lost her majority, she lost her, but she won the election. Yeah, but uh, uh, as many members of her party said it was her election. It was uh, she lost because uh, she lost the narrative. That's for sure. She she she, she lost her. She gamble, planned. She but planned. She, didn't lose the election. she planned to win uh, an absolute majority. Yeah. She and she, we all do. And she did not succeed. She did not succeed in in plus, that plus in that she goal. She didn't have to call the elections. She had a majority, mm. and she didn't have to call the I elections. Know, I know. So, so now she, well, she took she, a gamble. She, she will de goal. She will depend on political agreements, and and it well, will that's be. what you're asking for with the Six Republic. Is yeah, political deals. We, we're not talking <laughs> about about Britain. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I, I don't know how Emmanuel Macron will have to to deal with uh, uh, Theresa May. Um, I think that uh, he 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 showed a, a very pro-European uh, uh, view uh, during uh, the, the last election. So uh, I think he will uh, do uh, um, whatever he, he can to, to, to help Theresa May exiting the, the Brexit uh, the, the, mo the more easy, in the most easy, easy, easiest way. I, I, think, I think Macron has shown in the last few weeks that he understands the symbolism of international diplomacy as well as any other European leader does currently. And the fact that Theresa May projects weakness when she ran on being the strong and stable leader for the UK and then did this disastrous U-turn on this dementia tax uh, and, and then gambled and, and the final result was that she lost. Macron, on the other hand, has projected that, uh, that regal authority that the French have been missing since, uh, since uh, Jacques Chirac, our Arguably, or even before, and uh, and that may have also been a major factor in these elections that Macron has on the world stage, given the French this sense of grandeur, this sense of a strong leader who is willing to project uh, French leadership abroad. And I think that will uh, strengthen his hand in the European negotiations with uh, with Merkel and in the negotiations with uh, with Brexit. You know that your parties have actually lost two million votes between the presidential and the parliamentary elections. It was a terrible night for us last night. No, it was a, it was very good, <laughs> but I mean, at the end of the day, you still lost lost two million votes so it's it's it's, it's good to be to be proud and, and it's uh, and it's good to be uh, uh, forthcoming but at the end of the day these parliamentary elections are not as good as you may think although the numbers in in terms of seats they will be good of course but in terms of politically they are 
they have this um, inner weakness. I, I think you're right. The abstention is one of the. It's, it's a huge, it's a huge problem. But, but, but politics is made of three things. It's made of opportunities, decisions, and narratives, right? And there was an opportunity in this election. Emmanuel Macron made a couple of key decisions to capitalize on the weakness of the other parties. And now it doesn't matter necessarily if there are two, vote, two million votes fewer, two it's million votes strike. more. It's There's a strike. narrative that, uh, that uh, Emmanuel Macron has strength behind him, has momentum behind him. It remains to be seen if we can use that momentum to pass our program. But for the moment, he's in a very strong position. Bruno Bernard, so I'm for saying this is a, a golden opportunity for those who want a more federal Europe, saying uh, Macron has this little wind, narrow window of opportunity mm. to move on that. Your yeah, thoughts? Last time we asked France about that, they voted no. So um, I don't think that France has moved towards more federalism, more EU federalism, because they elected Macron. I, I strongly... But he said he ran on that ticket. He, he, this is what he said. I'm, he never, this is he, what I He represent. never actually said we're going to form a, no. a European federation. <laughs> that would have been slightly different. Uh, but I don't think that was the, the, the decision the maker. Yeah, I, think, I think he played it slightly different. He did propose multi-speeds Europe. He, does, he said that those that want to advance and get things moving quicker, because that That's is a very old a, idea. I mean, it's a, a large it, problem in the EU is, mm. you know, certain countries holding others back and decision making being laborious to say none the least and I think that's more where and Macron played he, in. He, he also wanted to insist on his difference uh, in, in concerning Europe uh, between his view and uh, the National Front view and exactly. the others. So I think that's why also he insisted uh, on the fact that he will uh, try to uh, strength uh, Europe. Uh, uh, and but, I mean, you're right. You, you talked about. I mean, you, you played that uh, uh, German uh, German uh, shot about yes, uh, um, no, but Macron. Macron. Um, and what Germany, before we talk about federalism or eurozone or, or, or a Europe president, they will want to see results, and that might take at least hmm. two to three years hmm. to start seeing results here in France. So federalism, I think, will take a a backseat on that. Mm. Have views towards Europe changed because of this election in a working class district like the one that you represent? They don't. Uh, no, I, I can't say they don't care about Europe uh, because they, they, they know that, that Europe has consequences on, the, on their lives. But they really uh, uh, care about local and direct changes in their lives. and. If they did not go to vote, that's just because they don't believe that Emmanuel Macron or anybody else can change their lives. And that's the main problem. And I think, and that's my, my point, that uh, nobody cares uh, in the national level about what n neighbors, uh, uh, social neighbors uh, like uh, Saint Denis, for example, uh, experience daily. I, I was. I have to. I think you're. You're really onto something. I think this is where the battle's going to be in the next year. I was knocking doors uh, uh, with an Almarche candidate in, in Lila, so in in, uh, in in Saint Saint Denis last week, and what the, it's really interesting how how split the opinions are on the ground about about Europe specifically because on the one hand there is skepticism about the system that it only takes care of the rich that it only takes care of the of the governing class. On the other hand, there is I think an appreciation of what are we call the valeurs républicaines that 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 the people who have, values. The, the Republican values the people who have come from other countries to live in France, um, appreciate the ability to uh, live with certain freedoms, with certain protections, with certain equal rights that they didn't have in, in, in other countries, and that Europe is the only place that really will stand up for these values in the age of Trump and Brexit and Putin and, and Bashar al-Assad. And I think there's a pride in working class areas, at least that I've, uh, that I've uh, noticed about that Europe standing for something, not just a program of federalism or, or fiscal reform, but standing for values. I think it's important. Lex Paulson, one final word on that. You mentioned Donald Trump. Mm. Did, did Emmanuel Macron make too much of that, you know, that handshake where he stared down uh, mm. uh, uh, Trump? Some people say, oh, he, he, he cost us uh, the U.S. leaving the, the, the climate change deal. Has he handled Trump right? <laughs> Um, I, I think uh, I think he has in the point in the point that the French people want to see their president going toe to toe with uh, this global bully that is currently occupying the White House. And the fact that Macron did not back down uh, in the face of this guy who plays to the spectacle, who plays to the cameras like this, I think was ultimately a plus. Did he should he have made as much as he as he did? Perhaps not. But I think the French people uh, gave him some credit for it in these elections. We, we lost it when he actually commented the handshake himself. Yeah, I think yeah. that was maybe maybe <laughs> that, that was a, a touch too much. But Trump. Trump was going to make the decision about climate no matter what. Maybe he should hire better people to communicate. Well, who knows? We can all communicate better. <laughs> Lex yes. Paulson, I want to thank you. Bruno Bernard, Majid Bissau, Dan Everfine. Stay with us, though. 
Media Watch is next. And we say hello to uh, Diptyque Laurent. I, I, I saw it written that uh, there was one winner from uh, Sunday night and lots of losers. That's right. A lot of bad losers, you might say, Francois. <laughs> bad losers. That's right. Uh, whether it's on French TV or Twitter, a lot of those losing candidates from the parliamentary elections have been letting loose on Monday, blaming everyone from Emmanuel Macron to Francois Hollande to a high level of abstention. The winner, really, the best bad loser, I guess you could say, or the one who's making the most comments or bringing the most comments, he was uh, not well. He was. He said he was running for the Conservative Party, but they hadn't really endorsed him. He was a dissident him. candidate. That's right. His name is Henri Gueno, and he only garnered four percent of the votes in a district of Paris. But he's clearly having a lot of trouble digesting that defeat. He's announced that he'll quit politics, but he had this to say uh, in an interview with a French TV station. Lectora. The electorate that voted in my district, the second district of Paris, that includes the 5th, 6th and 7th arrondissement, well, this electorate makes me want to puke. You heard me right. They make me vomit. On the one hand, you have a bunch of hipsters who all stick together. But, Mr. Guineau, your words are extremely harsh. Of course they're harsh, but I'm free to say them now. They're not worthy. <laughs> That's right, yeah, but I think he... Uh, he said it in a little bit of a less diplomatic way, and at the end of that, uh, uh, that comment, he says, well, I'm free now. I've quit politics, so I can say whatever I want. Well, uh, this user says, well, uh, don't forget that politicians are always at the service of voters and not the other way around. You need to get out, you petty little man. That's what this Twitter user says. Uh, but Geno is not the only one lashing out on Twitter. You have Thierry Mariani, who's, a, uh, he's, who's from the Conservative Party as well. He said uh, here that, uh, well, clearly, the, le travail de terrain, that sort of groundwork, the grunt work of campaigning, uh, is useless uh, because it didn't bring him any uh, victory. So really revealing how superficial sometimes that political campaign But he campaigning. wishes he hadn't campaigned. That's <laughs> right. He basically says, it's no point. I wish I hadn't spent all that time on the ground because it clearly didn't bring me a victory. Uh, you have another uh, MP, his name is, oh, well, hope to be an MP, Gilles Penel from the Front National, the uh, far right party, who said even if a goat had been <laughs> a candidate for the uh, En Marche of Ma Macron's party, well, that goat probably would have won. So trying to play <laughs> down uh, Macron's victory. While you have Francois Lamy, who's considered, again, a sort of rebel MP of the Socialist Party, he tweeted this saying, well, uh, rather sarcastically, a big thank you to Francois Hollande and Manuel Valls. Thank you for these moments. Uh, to which a uh, user on Twitter has said, well, uh, you're not even capable of uh, accepting your defeat. Your mediocrity is, uh, knows no bounds. So we're seeing a little bit of pushback from people on Twitter who are probably getting sick of seeing all these French MPs uh, rail on about their losses. All right, some have been more gracious in, 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 in defeat, including the, the standard bearer for the Socialist Party, the presidential election. He was eliminated in the first round, Benoit Hamon, uh, the socialists who uh, really suffered a crushing loss. A crushing loss. It's really been the focus of all the press, including the foreign press, as you see from the Telegraph here, uh, which says that they risk oblivion after a wipeout in parliamentary elections. Uh, and they say, the article, in this article, they say, well, no, nowhere was this defeat more symbolic than in the 19th arrondissement of Paris, mm. which was traditionally a socialist seat held by Jean-Christophe Combadelis, a veteran, I quote, with decades of experience. Well, he lost to a a man called Munia Majubi, a charismatic technology expert, and I quote, a political novice half his age, who's the son of a cleaning lady and a house painter of Moroccan origin. So really a strong message being sent from Emmanuel Macron that this new parliament, those representing him in parliament, will be of diverse backgrounds. And uh, on Twitter, you do get this idea that some socialist party MPs feel like the, the death knoll has already rung for the party. This is Jean-Jacques Urvoas, who uh, was former a... Former justice minister. That's right, a former justice minister. He, uh, was, he was representing a district in Brittany. 
He made it to the second round, but it's looking tough for him. And he said, la tempête, the storm, with this very uh, evocative picture of a sea storm. <laughs> uh, and you have Bruno Armand, who you mentioned there, who had a one-word Twitter uh, tweet as well. Sisif, who is uh, uh, So from... it looks like he's not quitting politics if he's like Sisyphus <laughs> climbing, the, well, climbing the mountain. I did check the story, and uh, Sisyphus uh, was forced to roll a boulder up a hill only for it to roll back down on him for eternity. So I think the idea is that the Socialist Party just keep getting smacked in the face over and mm. over with these defeats. Um, and finally, you have a Thierry Mondon, who's a, also a former socialist minister. He tweeted an interview that he gave this uh, Monday in which he said, we are floored, decapitated, and shot to pieces. Now, it's not all negative. Some users say that, well, it's a chance to, uh, for the ashes to, from, for a new party to be brought from the ashes. Well, that's looking difficult because we'll end with this cartoon, you see. Macron clearly st uh, st uh, stamping, stamping over all those roses that represent the Socialist Party. The, the symbol of the Ro Socialist Party, the rose. Diptyque Laurent, I want to thank you. I want to thank our panel once again. Thank you for joining us here in the France 24 debate. Revisited, presented by Stuart Norville. Kosovo, once a part of the former Yugoslavia, has been independent since 2008 when it split from neighboring Serbia. Most Kosovars are ethnic Albanians, but for the Serbs, Kosovo is the cradle of their civilization. And the Serbian minority in the north of the country refuses to recognize the government. Memories of the vicious conflict pitting Serbs against Albanian separatists remain deeply ingrained. A third of Kosovo's population is under 15 years old, Perhaps its youth will finally break the cycle of communitarian hatred. Revisited on France 24 and France24.com.